Hello, and welcome to the podcast with your host, or the Less is More Education podcast with your host, Steve Flores. And this is episode 25. We're a quarter of the way to 100 here. And today, uh, what I wanted to do is highlight some of the writing that I've been doing. Uh, You can find all my writing over at Substack. Uh, So it's, I believe it's Substack that, or lessismoreeducation.substack.com. And here I can write, I'm writing a bunch of things to kind of help teachers understand the research behind things like memory, which is something that I'm going to cover today. So today I review a theory of memory encoding and storage called the levels of processing theory, uh, levels of processing theory, authored by Fergus I M Craig and Robert S Lockhart. Uh, I found this theory to be pretty good at explaining a lot of the things that I was seeing in the classroom. So I thought I'd uh, I'd, I'd basically share uh, what I found out about it. All right, so here we go. Uh, for the longest time, I attributed selecting chemistry as my major um, to learning or as my late major to the idea that if you want to earn a lot of money, then you must be willing to do things that other people don't, which I got from a show called Dirty Jobs. Now, the problem with this is that when I actually looked up, all right, when did Dirty Jobs start running? Uh, Dirty Jobs started its first season in 2003. The problem is I graduated in 2002, so obviously I'm misremembering misremembering something. I know I'm not the only one that has had this experience. A lot of people can, you can even have this experience in mass, uh, the so-called Mandela effect. That's when whole groups of people are misremembering some idea, like is it the Berenstein Bears or is it the Berenstain Bears, or in my case, is it the Bernstein Bears, right? Like... I like there's a a lot to it there. Uh, This effect on memory can be explained by the levels of processing theory, which postulates that memory retention has more to do with the meaning behind your stimulus rather than the details of the stimulus itself. Um, And so what are the levels of processing? In 19, or the theory, in 1972, two professors from the University of Toronto, Fergus I.M. Craig and Robert S. Lockhart, wrote a seminal paper on the topic of memory research entitled um, The Levels of Processing, a Framework for Memory Research. This paper went on to influence um, a whole field of memory uh, with over 5,000 citations. That's quite a bit of citations. The paper was initially written as a refutation of the multi-store model of memory, which viewed memory as being very like computer-like. You get like an input, it goes through this processing core, then that processing core, then it gets stored into memory, um, which is very like rigid. Uh, and he said that, or and their argument was basically that memory shouldn't be seen as like these individual boxes, the individual modes. Instead, memory should be seen in terms of a continuum from the products of sensory analysis to the semantic associative process. So sensory analysis just refers to things that you pick up with your senses. So if you see something while you're seeing it, you're also storing it in some form of memory. Uh, the other thing that gets stored into memory are, the, are things that are part of your other five senses. So like touch, smell, uh, hearing, all of those things are being stored into your memory for short term. You obviously don't remember all of that information, right? Two or three days from now, you're not going to remember what you're smelling at this current moment. So uh, whereas semantic associative process, that has more to do with Meaning. So whenever I use the word semantic, just think meaning. I'm talking about meaning. So imagine you are hiking in the woods and you notice a green tube extending from the ground to the sky with protrusions periodically judging out the side. Uh, At about 18 inches from the ground, there is a dark circle with orange polka dots uh, encircled by a golden, like, uh, almond-shaped pieces of fabric that captures your attention. If that sounds really weird to you, it should, because this is not how we process the world. 
We're not little machines that pick up a bunch of details and then come up with the meaning after it. First, if you're walking down a, a path or you're on a nature walk and you see what you're going to see is plant. Hey, there's a plant that I've never seen before. Plant is a meaningful idea because a whole bunch of things can go into being a plant, right? A daisy is a plant, a, uh, an orchid's a plant, a lily's a plant. There's all these different things that get categorized as plant. So plant in itself is kind of like this, this catch-all and there's meaning there, right? Once you start to look at the plant more in detail, you get up close, then you start to notice the shape of the petals. You start to notice what's going on in the inside, what's going on with the stalk, the colors, uh, how often the leaves are protruding out the sides, whether or not the plant is looking alive and well or not so much. Um, so we perceive meaning way before we perceive the actual individual details. This is the, pro the basis of Craig and Lockhart's thesis. Because meaning takes primacy over detail, uh, people are primed to remember meaning rather than individual bits of information. We notice the plant we have never seen before, then we can filter the environment out to notice all the finer details, right? So when you're paying a lot of attention to something, what you're really doing is you're filtering out everything else that's going on around you. Uh, further, our ability to recall this particular plant is dependent on the meaning we attribute to the plant. If we're on a nature walk just for the sake of having fun, we're not going to store that plant into our long-term memory. It's just like going to get stored as, oh, that's something cool to look at. If we are in a nature walk because we intend to bring our class on this exact same spot or to this exact same spot to explore the local flora, now we're more likely to remember that plant. So the intent imbues things with meaning. The levels of processing model views memory on a continuum of analysis from the products of our sensory analysis to the products of our semantic associated pro associations or process. So that's our intent. Superimposed onto that memory system is a second system which retains information by recirculating information at one level of processing. This second system is later going to be called by uh, a guy named Alan Badelli, uh, working memory. In the paper, we are going to have two types of memory. Type one is going to be this uh, processing that refers to working memory, right? So things that we're keeping in our head, right? We, and we can either keep things in our head by constantly reciting them with our internal voice or by constantly looking at a certain object that's going into our short-term memory there's also another uh type of me uh processing which is going to be called type 2 processing which refers to like a deeper semantic meaning processing right so now what we're doing is we're taking a look at the meaning behind objects um however like when we say deeper in meaning, that's kind of a misnomer because meaning isn't really all about depth, about how deep you can look at something. Meaning is more about breadth, like how wide something is, right? So semantic processing is more about how many connections can we draw to the stimulus from what is already in our web of understanding or our web of learning, which you might have might remember from uh, your correct credentialing program. So if we can connect more and more things to this new stimulus, this new object that currently exists in our background of understanding, then we're going to be imbuing this thing with more and more meaning. And that's going to be, that's going to raise the chances that it's going to be stored into our long-term memory. So in our initial example, you might notice that whether a novel plant is put into long-term memory is highly dependent on our intention. Intention corresponds with the spread of cognitive encoding. A new plant on a recreational hike just gets categorized as cool things to look at, whereas preparing a classroom for excursion categorizes the plant as not just cool things to look at, 
but a potential hands-on experience, an opportunity to teach about adapt- adaption, uh, an opportunity to think about to uh, to bring in uh, ecosystems and etc. And if you're a biologist, which I'm not clearly, um, then you're going to be able to come up with more and more ways why this plant is going to be meaningful. So that intent is you drawing in those connections. Because we're using type 2 processing to understand that novel plant, then we're doing everything necessary to store that thing into our long-term memory. According to Craig and Lockhart, retention, so that's how long something stays in our memory, uh, depends on the amount of attention that we give a stimulus, the compatibility of the stimulus with our analyzing structures, and the processing time we give the stimulus. So those are the three things. If you intend to learn more about the stimulus, then you will give it more attention. You are more likely to pay more attention to the structure of the plant, to where the plant is. You're also more likely to think of ways that you can use the plant uh, and more likely to compare that plant to a bunch of other plants that you may be familiar with. Uh, Notice that a biologist, once again, is going to have more ways of analyzing this plant Those ways of analyzing this plant are what we call the analyzing structures. So if it's compatible, right, if a biologist sees a plant and has all these skills of ways that you can look at this plant, then it's going to be more likely to store into long-term memory. Whereas if you take a biologist, you make them stare at a bowling ball, they're not going to have as many ways to process this bowling ball because that's not within their their realm of expertise. Um, And if you plan to use the plant for future activity, you're also going to be thinking about that plant both consciously and subconsciously. Your mind is going to be thinking about the plant, right? You might take, like, while you're lesson planning, active time to think about that plant and then think about, all right, what am I going to do with this? How am I going to incorporate this? What are the students going to be doing with this, right? And subconsciously, that processing is also going to be happening. And that's what's going to create this long-term lasting memory uh, to occur. Uh, Each activity contributes to retention of the type 2 level of processing of the plant because they impart meaning on the plant. This implies that meaning can be attributed to uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, Although the paper focuses on verbal and pictorial modes of memory, Craig and Lockhart also do believe that the levels of processing exist in the perceptual analysis of sounds, sights, smells, etc. So any of the five senses. This is because people are capable of storing pictures, not just pictures, but also faces and tunes and scents and voices uh, into our long-term memory. And some people are, are better at the verbal stuff. So like names and things like that. Like, I am not there. I can remember a person's face. I will never remember their name. I Sometimes I run into students out in the street, and I'm like, hey, I know I know you, but that name is gone. And we're going to go into, like, a whole reason why that might be next week. Um, although, so... Uh, all the evidence that they had at the time, so this is back in 1972, had to do with like phonemes and pictures and like intents and, and things like that. So they hadn't yet developed like a breadth of knowledge <clears throat> using all the five senses to understand memory. So Craig and Lockhart uh, go on to reexamine the studies on different phenomena to kind of use their model to come up with explanations. So different phenomena include incidental learning, selective attention and sensory storage, the short-term versus long-term distinction, the serial position curve and repetition and rehearsal effects to show how the level of processing model explains all of these phenomena. And that's really the best way to test out a model is you take a model and then you test it against all these observations that you've made. And if the model can hold up to all this testing, then it's probably going to be a good model or a better model. And we do that not just in or in psychology, but also in chemistry and physics and uh, biology and anything. Right? Even you can even take a historical analysis and things in that manner as well. So if it stands up to this battery 
of testing, then it's going to be a better explanation model. And so here's an example of one of one thing that I thought was cool was uh, this thing called the serial position curve, um, which is like this U-shaped curve that gets that comes out when you plot um, the position of a word in a list versus the percentage chance that a person will be able to recall that word, right? So you basically have the first word through the 20th word, and then the chance of whether or not you're going to remember those words. And what you'll see is when you test people in this, you start to see this U-shaped bell curve, meaning people can remember the first few words and the last few words, but most people cannot remember the words that are in the middle. And this is explained by the two levels of processing. When you tell somebody, hey, I'm going to give you a list of words to remember, start remembering them. What that does is it starts to imbue those words with meaning, right? So you start to go, okay, I'm going to start remembering these words. So as you get each word in the beginning, you're using that level two processing to store them into memory because you're doing the things necessary to pay attention to these words. As that processing becomes overwhelmed because you're getting more and more and more words, most people can't keep more than like three or four, like what you call like individual items, right? Or items in their head. Uh, some people can go up to like seven or eight, and we're going to learn more about that when we get into working memory. But that, uh, those words, you're, they're going to stick into your long-term memory. As the list goes on, because your type two uh, system of processing becomes overwhelmed, then your brain is going to switch over to type one. And type one is just like that rote memorization of like, all right, I'm just trying to I'm just going to repeat these words in my head to kind of just keep them in there, right? And then so when you ask the the people to recall the word immediately after, they're going to remember the first few because of that type two processing, and then the last few words they're going to remember because it's still kind of fresh in their minds. And then all the words that were in the middle, those go away. Like most people cannot remember those at all. It's a really interesting um, way of looking at it. And then so this levels of processing, you can see if you read the paper, uh, which I'll link below, you can also see, oh, this is where, um, uh, this is how they use that model to explain all these other phenomena. So why is this important to education? Well, learning and meaning are intimately connected. This is highlighted by the fact that rote memorization always does worse than semantic processing, right? If you ask people to remember things just by saying them over and over and over and over again, yes, yeah, some of that stuff might be put into the long-term memory, but it's not going to be good if the intent to understand that stuff goes away, right? So uh, if you want your students to remember a concept or a word, then you must imbue whatever that concept or word is with a ton of meaning, and that meaning must be accessible to the students themselves. If it's not accessible to them, then you're going to run into problems, and I'll go into why in a little bit. So, for example, uh, most students that I, I've had to deal with were suburban students. If I show them a picture of a plant that I found on my nature walk, or a picture of a rocket, or a picture of the solar system, they are not going to be able to connect to that information whatsoever because that's not a part of their web of understanding, right? They like maybe they'll see some similar plants and understand, oh, that's kind of like the thing that I see in my backyard. Um, or maybe they've seen like videos of rockets, or maybe they've seen you know pictures of the solar system, but that's not really connecting with them as people, right? Or as with their webs of understanding. So However, there are other forms of stimulus that can be substituted, right? So instead of showing a, pic a picture of a plant, you can walk students over to like a little garden. And most schools have some, like even if it's just a few plants, a little garden in there or maybe an area where there's trees. And they can connect to that because that's a part of their daily lives. Or they can recall like, oh, yeah, like my grandma plants a, a bunch of plants in my backyard. I know what those look like. And then you can start to get into uh, a conversation about like, well, what do those things need to survive, right? What do you see around those things? Like what kinds of animals do you see around them? Like do you ever look at them? Do you ever smell them, right? And we'll go into those other things 
a little bit later on. And the same problem with a rocket, right? Rockets are cool in theory and like, yeah, but it's hard to connect to. What students can connect to might be like a Nerf gun, a projectile, projectile motion, right? Or you can even uh, teach, use it to teach uh, other forms of Newton's laws. Or instead of the solar system, maybe starting with the solar system isn't a good idea, but most students know what like a coin orbiter is, right? A coin orbiter is if you go to like any museum or any like, like children's park, uh, it's those things that you, where you drop in a coin and then it spins them in a circle, circle, circle until it goes into like this little hole in the middle and it starts to go faster and faster and faster the further down it goes. Like more students are gonna be able to connect to that idea than to a picture of the solar system. That's gonna be pretty uh, unfamiliar or foreign to them. And that's because that is not connecting or that's not giving them a whole lot of meaning, they're less likely to interact with it. They're less likely to uh, work with that information. So uh, let, on top of uh, taking all of these uh, things that are more familiar, you can also leverage the five senses to try and draw more and more connections. Again, <clears throat> it's about the width of connections, not the depth of connections. So how many connections can you make? So if you take them to like a local garden, so I remember at my school that I used to work at, we used to have like a little rose garden, right? It wasn't very big, but you know, it had a few, quite a few bushes in there, maybe 12 bushes. You can connect things in that area to the students. You can ask them, hey, look, what color do you see? What colors do you see? Or what do you smell? And do those colors remind you of anything? Do those smells remind you of anything? What does it feel like, right? Or if you have like a Nerf dart gun, like pick up a dart, right? How does it feel like? Does it weigh the same in all areas, right? Or is it unevenly distributed? Or if you have um, like a coin orbiter, right? And you can even come up with like a way of, uh, of creating a little coin orbiter by taking a large fabric and putting like a heavy ball, like a bowling ball in the middle of it, and then rolling like marbles around it. It's kind of the same thing as a coin orbiter. And you can have them use things like sound. Hey, look, what does it sound like? Or what are you seeing, right? Uh, sound can more often connect things of like speed, right? If you hear something going, right? That sound can now connect to some other idea that they are familiar with, with speed, because most kids in suburban areas are aware of cars, right? And they know that, oh, a car makes one noise when it's going slow, and it makes a different noise when it's going fast. And you can connect that idea to uh, a coin orbiter or a coin going around an orbiter, or marbles going around a, like, a homemade orbiter that you make. So leveraging your senses helps them create those connections. Uh, you can also leverage intent, right? Intent is one of the most important things. Now, you can either give students a task or what's even better is you can let students select a task. Uh, earlier, we talked about motivation and motivation is connected to choice. So you can embed that into your lesson as well, right? You can have a list of different questions. And questions are the best way to give tasks because they are easier to understand. If you give a student a command, A, it, tells, it feels like you're telling them what to do. But if you give them a list of questions and you ask them, hey, choose some of these questions. What, what do you think is most interesting to you? Now you're giving them the role of taking ownership over that intent, right? And then now they can go like, okay, this is what I'm going to do with, the, these are things that I'm doing because I chose to do them, because I'm choosing to do this, uh, this question, right? So you, you can have them answer questions like, like where do plants get their, their mass? Or how do the plants get heavier and heavier the bigger they get? Or uh, do Nerf darts all fall at the same speed, like horizontally as they do vertically when you shoot them at an angle? Uh, do coins with more mass or marbles with more mass travel around the orbiter differently than those with very little mass? And um, 
And then by getting them to answer these questions and getting them to write down their answers or getting them to like even make predictions, now you're getting, giving them a reason, an intent. And again, that's leveraging this meaning, right? You're, at, you're putting it in terms of a puzzle for them to figure out. And now because they have it in terms of a puzzle as opposed to a, a task that they have to complete, that puzzle thinking allows them to tap into the subconscious and conscious thinking of this thing. Now there's something that I need to figure out. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to think about this, not just in my conscious mind, but in my subconscious mind, he's going to be, be thinking about it and trying to come up with answers to this. Um, and yeah. And so the last, the next part of this is you don't just want to give them a task or questions to answer. You also want to give them the skills, skills that they need to do their investigation. So as an example, if you are investigating how things fall or projectile motion and you want them to look at the speed of a projectile, students must know how to calculate the speed of a projectile. All right, how do I figure this out? How do I separate it into an X and Y axis? How do I, uh, what am I gonna use to measure time? What am I gonna use to measure distance? Um, how do I know that the speed at this point is going to be the same or different than the speed at this point? Uh, you're also going to need to show them how to like re write down important information, right? So what are do they need to know the who, what, when, where, why? How should they write that down? Do they need to know how to do the uh, how to collect the data? They need to know. Do they know how to come up with questions? How to write a hypothesis so that they can answer? right? All that stuff must be explicitly taught. So the skills must be taught, but the content should be up to them to figure out, and they should be using the skills. And again, this goes back into motivation. Once they see that their skills are being successful at their ability to analyze whatever it is that they're trying to analyze, then that's going to give them ownership over what they've done, what they've learned. Um, and as far as like, like what the what this levels of processing model can show us, there are some precautions that you should take on. And the precautions usually have to do with like the idea that if you overwhelm your type two processing, type one processing is going to take over. And because type one processing puts things into short term memory and type two processing put things into long term memory, you don't want to overwhelm type two because they're not going to remember it. And so what are these uh, like little precautions that you can take? Uh, so if you think about the, or I'm going to kind of read this note that they wrote, uh, Craig and Lock Lockhart note, increasing presentation rate or using unfamiliar words inhibits or prevents processing to those levels necessary to support long-term retention. So again, you don't want to overwhelm their type 2 because type 2 takes a long, longer time, right? And you want to go slower rather than faster. And you want to stick with the words that they understand, right? Introducing too much academic vocabulary is going to overwhelm them. Now, if you front load all that vocabulary in the beginning, then maybe it won't be so bad. But then vocabulary runs into this other problem where if you front load a bunch of words that they don't draw connections to, then, you know, what have you really done, right? And so it gets really complicated really fast in terms of understanding this idea of memory and how things are stored into long-term memory. And the other thing that, that was kind of uh, inferred but not mentioned is you can overload your stimulus, right? So if you think about that U-shaped S-curve that occurs when you give students like 20 words to memorize, you're, you can overload them by giving them too much stimulus all at once. So really what you should do is you should just focus on a question and just that one question at a time. If you start to add in more and more variables and more and more things that the students have to do, then they're going to be overwhelmed, and then they're, they're going to be using more of that type 1 processing as opposed to that type 2 processing. And this also has implications for if you're doing some kind of a lecture, if you're posting something up on the board, or even uh, what your room looks like. 
if there's too many things, too many distractors, then they're not going to be able to, you know, filter that stuff out or they'll be less likely to filter that stuff out and focus on the thing that you want them to focus on. Uh, the authors also mentioned that there must be a connection between how the stimulus was encoded and how you're going to recall that information. So the circumstances around how they are absorbing the information should be the same as when you're recalling them. So if you are teaching about students about plants by taking them to a garden, when you assess them, it would really be beneficial if you're standing in the garden while you assess them. Um, and if you increase the amount of ways that the information is coded, then the kids will be a little bit more flexible, right? So if you encode it visually and through sight and through pictures and through words and through smells and through like manipulatives, if you do enough of those things, because again, each one of those things draws a meaning line from the new thing to what's already in their memory, then you're going to uh, like be able to stick, though the students will be able to be more flexible overall. And so details, like when I remembered advice from Dirty Jobs or whether it's Berenstein Bears or Berenstain Bears are likely a so are a likely a problem of how our memory works, right? So kind of connecting this all back together to what I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, I had this story, and the story basically says, or the meaning behind the story was, I had gotten this piece of information that if I study something that nobody else knows or understands, then uh, I'll be successful, right? And the details of who taught me that, right? Whether it was a teacher, a movie, a TV show, or Mike Rowe, those are like the fine details things that aren't being stored into my long-term memory because they're not as meaningful as the actual idea and how I incorporated it into my life. I created the story of like, hey, I'm going to study chemistry because nobody else wants to do it. Um, and I inserted later on this idea that I got that idea from Dirty Jobs. But that's just a misremembering on my part because the detail where I got it from is less important than the meaning behind that detail. And this should also cause us to have a little bit more sympathy for when we see people, especially public figures, that like misremember things or have a recall of something that maybe didn't necessarily happen. Um, and you should ask yourself, like, all right, what was the meaning there? What was the, the intent there, right? And because all of our memories are flawed, we should have a little bit of sympathy and we should have a little bit of empathy for everyone in those cases. Well, I hope you enjoyed the podcast and found it useful. If you do, if you did, if you dude, <laughs> if you did to support the podcast, uh, like and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to it and give us a, a rating. Uh, you can also email me at lessismore.education education at skiff.com or find me on Instagram at lessismore.education. Uh, the Twitter is at lessismore, E-D-U-C-1. Uh, and the Patreon, again, it would really help me out if you bought me a coffee a month. That'll keep this going. Uh, and that's all you really have to donate. I think it's like three, it's either three or five dollars. I set it to the lowest amount possible. And uh, there you'll be able to interact with me a little bit more. It's uh, on patreon.com forward slash less is more education, or you can join the Substack. Uh, there you have the option of doing like a subscri uh, subscribe and then the option of paying or not is really up to you. The content's going to be more or less the same. Um, and there you can find me at lessismoreeducation.substack.com. And that's more of where I put my writing. And if you're more inclined to like writing or reading things rather than uh, the, you know, the verbal, audio, you know, visual of the podcast, then, um, then you can find me there. I appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>